Well, Dr. James Lovelock and other scientists have suggested that without ice caps, the wind and the ocean currents could stall and, and become very pacified, and that could have big changes for the world's climate. Can you talk about that? Sure, we've known from deep time again that when we have times of no ice, that's simply because it's very, very hot. Uh, the way the world works when global warming happens, it does not happen at the same temperature range all over the planet. The, the ice areas, the areas that now have ice, in fact, heat up a whole lot more. We're seeing that now. We're seeing that the Arctic and the Antarctic are warming much faster than the equator. The equator is already so hot, it can't get a whole lot hotter but the poles can certainly get a lot hotter. And what causes ocean circulation and wind in the first place? It is simply temperature differences. Whenever we get wind, it's because there's someplace hotter and someplace warmer around us, and the air is trying to move from one place to the other. Well, it's the same for ocean currents. The problem being is that once ocean currents slow or stop, oxygen availability to the deep ocean slows and stops. You start losing oxygen. So that's where you can really have some major problems. And you alluded to something earlier, which I've heard from Dr. James Hansen, which is that uh, once this process begins, there could be a tipping point beyond which we don't, you know, reducing our carbon emissions and such may not have any effect. That it seems in the Earth's past, once the slide of ice goes off Greenland and Antarctica, it just keeps going under its own power. Did I get that right? Oh, that's totally correct. Again, this is the scariest aspect is that there is this sense of a tipping point. Uh, no one quite knows what the level of carbon dioxide that it would be, but we do know, again, that if we go into deep time, there's been little or no ice at all at a 1,000 parts per million. Now, getting to a 1,000 parts per million means burning up a whole lot of oil and coal, and it's almost a case where you think, gee, maybe we'll run out of both before we hit a 1,000 or before we have a thousand long enough to melt everything. Maybe we'll hit a thousand and it'll dip back down. The fact is there's a great amount of coal on this planet. The greatest misnomer to me of all is this mantra, clean coal, clean coal. Well, there's no such thing. I mean, there is no such thing. Burning coal as the cheapest form of energy, and once oil is gone, as you well know, it will be the cheapest form of energy. Or the oil shales. I mean, the great, the great happenstance that's going on in Canada and Alberta right now with those oil shales that will be or might be or soon could be one of the greatest single point sources of emissions on planet Earth is the formation of oil from oil shales. This is a, a really energy intensive, emissions intensive production. Well, as we start to wrap up our conversation, which I'm really enjoying incidentally, what other scientific research are you most excited about or worried about? What's got your interest? Well, the hope is the, what, the reason we went to Antarctica in the first place is to hopefully get a, get a sense of, is it possible that perhaps our models are wrong? Maybe, maybe it's just possible that a thousand parts per million will still let us have at least some ice sheets. And so we're looking at Cretaceous Age rocks, these rocks from 65 to 125 million years old, to try to see how rapidly the sea level go up and down and up and down. Maybe there was ice sheet information to be had. Maybe we could still keep some of the ice at least at a thousand parts per million. And if so, it, it really tells us that maybe we're going to have a little bit more time to deal with emissions. My worry is that it's not, but uh, this, is, this is kind of the all-consuming thing to figure out right now. How high can CO2 be? and allow you to still have ice. In other words, how long can we still keep Antarctica and Greenland at a thousand parts per million? Can you recommend a website for people who want to find out more? Um, I think that really the, the best climate source on the planet is called realclimate.com and this is a consortium of climate people from many different countries but they're not rabid crazies, but they're not conservative crazies. This is really middle of the road. Real climate, I guess it's realclimate.org. Yeah, that's it, realclimate.org. And this is where I get most of my climate information. I've been in touch. These people are really great. Right. I think Gavin Schmidt is one of the uh, good writers there. And I, I check it out on a regular basis. Our yep. guest has been uh, Peter Ward. He's a paleoclimatologist and biologist at the University of Washington. He's got a new book out called The Flooded Earth, Our Future 
Let's see. Our future in a world without ice caps. That's it. Yeah. And I find Peter's books are really exciting to read. They're page turners. They're kind of like detective novels or maybe they're horror books because <laughs> they're kind of scary. But uh, they're definitely nonfiction. They are fact-based. And you want to get some good science, you go to Peter Ward. Thank you very much for joining Thanks us. Thanks so much for having me. EcoShock Today. Radio EcoShock, thank you very much for joining us today.